Dr. Charles Jackson has four degrees, including a bachelor's in biology, a master's in environmental biology, and a master's in science education from George Mason's University, and a doctorate in science education from the University of Virginia. He taught secondary school for 11 years, college biology and chemistry for six years, and then teacher education classes for six years in Virginia, Maryland, Vermont, and Tennessee. In 2003, Dr. Charles Jackson founded Points of Origins Ministries and began teaching, speaking, and debating in creation science education. His emphasis has been in making the case for the literal interpretation of the scriptural accounts as being both scientifically and historically true, and indeed eminently superior in their accuracy compared to secular sources referencing the same topic. We are honored to have Dr. Charles Jackson here with us this evening to talk about the topic, Is Darwinian Evolution Scientific or Non-Scientific? Please uh, help me welcome Dr. Charles Jackson. Thank you, Josh. Uh, yeah, Josh kind of gave the church guy side of me too, but of course what we're doing here tonight is the science side of everything. I'm not a theologian, but I am a science teacher. Those are my credentials, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yes, actually, we should all be thinking, and that would go for scientists, that would go for religionists, because the primary goal that ought to be, if you're honest and not a hypocrite, is the truth about everything. And you know what? I just don't care about anything else. Uh, I just ask the planet Pluto. Yeah, I'm going to see how many people knew what that was. Um, I mean, Percival Lowell was probably wrong. It was probably a planetoid all this time. But we sit down here and we vote on what the universe is like, and we think that actually changes it. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you think, and my opinion doesn't matter at all. We can talk about wonderful things that could have happened and how they could have happened, and that's fun. It's cool. Uh, but that doesn't matter really in the end what did happen is all that counts for anything. What is real is all that counts for anything. And people in religion, yeah, we've got hypocrites there. People in science, yeah, we've got hypocrites there. And in both groups, there's also got people who don't necessarily know what they're talking about or know what they actually are standing for. What I want to do is lay a groundwork for you, a solid bulkhead here of what the topic is. Is Darwinian evolution scientific or not? Well, now you heard my credentials. I'm going to say it's not. But I'm going to make the case as to why. Doesn't mean it's a bad idea, it just means it's not a scientific idea. Bigfoot's not scientific, aliens aren't scientific, the Loch Ness Monster, I saw Nessie out there on the sidewalk, is not a scientific concept because there are no data points, there's no way to experiment on it. Oh yeah, and creation science can't qualify as a scientific model either because you can't go back and experiment in the past on that either. You can't make God create the universe again. And you can't make evolution happen again either. The both of them are forensic, historical sciences, not about operational science or things we can actually subject to the scientific method. Cool ideas, but not provable in the sense of the scientific method. That's a philosophical idea, but it's also the rules of how science works. Is evolution a scientific concept? No, it's not going to be and never can be. Uh, can people choose to subscribe to that model of how the universe got started and life got here? Sure they can, but it would be uh, hypocritical and the severe to say that if you don't subscribe to this particular highly hypothetical thing, that, that there's something wrong with you or you're incorrect, especially since it doesn't qualify as a scientific model. Let's, let's go ahead and see what I'm talking about. Nikola Tesla said in the 1890s, Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments. They wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. Experimentation is the scientific method. And if it's something you can't experiment on, it might be a cool idea, it might be fun to talk about, but it isn't scientific. Is Darwinian evolution scientific or not? Our topic. Linus Pauling, who won the Nobel Prize in the 1950s for 
inventing the concept or discovering the concept of in electronegativity uh, in 1932, and then he won the Nobel Peace Prize for being a famous scientist against the proliferation of nuclear weapons in the 1960s. He said this, science is the search for what? Truth. Truth. See, I taught junior high and high school, so I expect these kind of things. I do these fill-in-the-blank things. Science is a search for the truth, the effort to understand the world. Uh, he actually guessed that the DNA molecule was going to be a triple helix. That's okay. He already had two Nobel Prizes. It's all right. And here's Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous spokesmen for evolution, uh, evolution science and atheism in the world. Now, granted, he's not the poster boy I would want if I was an atheistic evolutionist. And actually, they've been doing some... Uh, uh, sensitivity training with him and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, is probably better at all of this, and I have more respect for him. But actually, it's hard for me to respect someone who says something like this. In the New York Times, this is an attitude we've got here. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Now, I wouldn't say that about people who disagree with me, that they're ignorant, stupid, and insane just because they disagree with me. But that is an attitude that we do find. And why do you have to say something like that if you really know you're standing on solid scientific ground? This is another little lampoon thing I saw on the internet where here's the creationism. It looks like the SS Minnow on the Gilligan's Island. And there's a big wave of science coming over it, just squashing down on it. Well, you know, I mean, I could, I could just label that Darwinism also. It would be just as valid when you look at the truth about this. Uh, here's something, the flat earth model, uh, Hot Springs, South Dakota, and uh, I often get people throwing me right in there. You know, I got the four degrees, you know, I'm in men's and all that, and, and I've been teaching science for all this time. I have a lifelong love for science and truth and logic and evidence and all that. And yet people throw me in with people who believe the earth's flat and the sun goes around the earth. And I never believed that. I don't know. Well, I have met some people who believe the sun goes around the earth and they kind of scare me. Um, but flat earth, flat earth, and here's a little surprise you'll see, just to get rid of the lampoon, the person who's the head of the flat earth society, and you can check the uh, uh, reference here, is actually a guy who believes in evolution. Am I trying to say that all evolutionists are flat earthers? No, but everywhere I go, evolutionists are always trying to say all creationists are flat earthers. I have never met someone who believed the earth is flat, but here in this article, I found out the guy who's the head of that society actually also buys evolution. Okay, I'm just trying to get rid of stereotypes. The one thing that is, is universal about stereotypes is they are dumb. They might pick up on one thing, cherry pick something that somebody likes because it makes the opposition to them uh, look bad. Either the way they look or smell or act or what they say or anything like music they like or food they like to eat, whatever. Stereotypes are universally uh, short, short-sighted. So let's get rid of those kind of things. I'm not a flat earther just because I'm a creationist. And I also don't have the IQ of a paper bag just because I believe that creation is true. But that's not the topic. It's is evolution scientific or not? Well, okay, here's a little thing here. I see evolution happening in my lab all the time. It's a fact. Now, when people say, I see evolution, we know evolution happens, it's usually something like, well, the peppered moths in England, industrial melanism of the Biston betularia moth, slight changes in the allele frequencies in a population of living things, in a gene pool, and they'll say, that's evolution, and it proves it. And he, the, what the guy here is saying, I see evolution all the time, but the younger fellow there is thinking he's meaning that we came from a bacteria and worms and then something like a rat and then monkeys to people. Uh, that's what people think when you say the word evolution, but when you actually talk about what we can observe and see and we know it happens, it's not that process. It's something else, like natural selection. Survival of the fittest. We all know the fit survive better, and, and that's great, you know, survival of the fittest, but survival of the fittest is not the same thing as evolution. This is a horrifying uh, misconception that natural selection and evolution are the same thing. We can see natural selection. We can observe natural selection. We can do tests and experiments on natural selection. It's documented. 
But natural selection is only survival of the fittest. It has nothing to do with how the fit got here to survive. You see, an evolution claims to have the answer to how the fit got here. Natural selection claims to have the answer to how the fit survived and the rest of them didn't. And so that winnows out the defective or less effective alleles in the population. But natural selection is only a screening process. The word select, let's pick a synonym for select. It would be, I said it. What's a synonym for select? Choose or pick. Yeah, I said, let's pick a synonym for select. I can give you a hint. You know, this was not a hard test. OK, here are the kinds of things you see. This is the, I'm not kidding, this is the standard fare in the textbooks in the chapter on evidence for evolution or proof of evolution. Nowadays, they tend to sprinkle these things throughout the entire book, uh, listing in other different kinds of chapters. But homologous organs, vestigial organs or junk organs, Vestigial DNA, or junk DNA. Uh, vertebrate embryology, that human embryos go through all these phases, recapitulating our evolutionary history. The origin of life, saying, how could life have started all by itself? And I'll make the flat statement that if, if you do believe the evolution posit, you must be leave in spontaneous generation. Because if you believe in the evolutionary Darwinian posit, you believe there was a time where there was no life on this planet, and then there was life on this planet, and that is life happening all by itself and creating itself. And you could even extend that to the universe creating it, itself also by a quantum fluctuation of the Big Bang. New news on that happened this week, but that's another topic. <clears throat> so the uh, origin of life uh, by, by uh, evolution would be a spontaneous generation. Moths, the peppered moths, like the professor was saying, maybe he was a professor to the young fella, and the horse evolution series. Uh, the idea that germs are becoming, uh, evolving to be immune to our new drugs and medicines, it never happens. Oh, Dr. Jackson, aren't you, don't you know that happens? Mm -hmm. There are only three ways that can happen and none of them are Darwinian. None of them will make bacteria. We have evolved by mutations since the way that we became the master species on the planet. You know, the way that X-Men movies start out you know, mutation. Uh, mutation can't change bacteria into people and T-Rexes, pterodactyls and condors and elephants, giraffes and dogs and horses and cats and pigs. Uh, it just can't and neither, neither can these bacteria develop new traits. Uh, we could talk about that. Finches, the Galapagos finches on, uh, on the Galapagos Islands that Darwin looked at and Rosemary and Peter Grant did the 20 year research, the beak of the finch. And uh, again, these processes are cool, they're interesting, most of them are natural selection. None of them are a process that can get you uh, from uh, bacteria to, to uh, a eukaryotic cells, much less get a single-celled organism to a multi-celled organism like you. None of these processes has any mechanics that can do that. And yet, people say, you know, believe in this, and, and now you know evolution's true. Most of these are natural selection. Uh, the list of organs that, and body parts that are useless, we now find out none of them are useless. For decades, that was proof of evolution, that these organs were leftovers from back in the day when we were rats and, and uh, whatever, monkeys and lizards and fish and things like that. Just like the junk DNA was supposed to be leftover DNA from when we were rats and fish and lizards and things. And that just turned out to be miserably not true. Uh, and all the final research has been done on. That is not true. There, there is no such thing as junk DNA. And the lead researchers at MIT and Harvard, the Chimp Genome Project, the ENCODE Project, have all finally come out with that. You know what, guys? Uh, we were wrong all these years. There is no such thing as junk DNA. Uh, this, in 2004, was every once in a while the big tabloids or the popular science journals like Omni and Wired and Discover and National Geographic will come up with an issue all about why everyone should believe in Darwinian evolution. And uh, of course, the article was provocatively titled, Was Darwin Wrong? Of course, their answer was no, it's not really wrong. Some of the evidence is also some of the same stuff in the textbooks. The horse evolution thing, natural selection being uh, issued out as proof of evolution. In 1905, Hugo de Vries said, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, 
but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. And indeed, the process has no power at all to create anything, only to maintain the integrity of a gene pool, not to create it or establish it. Homology, the similarity of different organs like a human arm to the horse front leg or the bat wing or something like that. Uh, dog variation, all the different breeds of dogs saying that that's evolution when it's not. Antibiotic resistance, I put that in big red letters because National Geographic said that was the very best proof of evolution, so I made that in big red letters. The idea, all the fossils leading from monkeys to humans, and uh, really, there aren't any. There just aren't any. I mean, the big ones that everyone knows about, everybody who digs up one of these fossils will tell you, this is not the missing link, but it looks very like the missing link. It's either in the wrong layer, it has some anatomical differences, skeletal differences. How many ever heard of Artie? Artie, Artipithecus ramidus. They even had a little rap on YouTube, Artipithecus ramidus. She's related to all of us, you know. And this guy would do an Artie dance. Tim White from UCAL Berkeley, who, who did all the research on the fossil and presented it in 2010, said, this is not the missing link. Yet it showed up, uh, that was uh, in, in uh, October, it showed up next July on the front cover of National Geographic as the uh, uh, four, uh, three, three and a half million year old lady or woman. So people don't listen to the people who do the primary research. They will usually tell you something disqualifies it. It's not the missing link. We need to keep on looking. It can really give us a lot of clues uh, about how evolution might have happened, but this is not the missing link. And then the finch beak things. Again, that's so famous. Everyone likes to talk about it, so I put that in red, too. Uh, <clears throat> I do, of course, as you might have noticed, uh, believe that there is a problem. There are some problems going on, um, uh, actually perceptual problems, where we get away from hard science and straight-line thinking, and we, we walk off into uh, stories, cherished anecdotes that bolster up and buoy up an idea which there's nothing wrong with that, but when you bolster up and you float an idea on cherished anecdotes um, and soft philosophy, you really can't then package it up and sell it to people as hard science. I don't think people are deliberately lying. I think they're just caught up in the pep rally. And so what I'm trying to do here is, let's just you know, throw a little cold water on our faces and think. Just think. Deep thoughts, real thoughts, you know, get there. Hard, solid thinking. That's all that's going to work in science. There's so many other things we can do, but in science, it's got to be hard stuff. How many of you ever seen this high school biology textbook before? It's the most common high school biology textbook in the United States, adopted in many states. Kenneth Miller and Joseph Levine. Let's take a look, and I want just to so show you, when you are thinking truth and right, uh, you can, all of your thoughts and all of your claims and, and lines of thinking will always go in straight lines, parallel, never colliding with each other, contradicting each other for eternity, for infinite. Parallel lines never cross. But if you are actually thinking something that's wrong, all you have to do is extrapolate, you know, uh, bring it to the uh, almost absurd extreme, and you'll see that it doesn't work if it doesn't work. Uh, eventually, your wrong thinking will crisscross itself. I want you to see in this textbook where wrong thinking led by um, the encouragement that, that the Darwinian posit is valid actually causes conflict. Let's take a look on page 13 of a primary based textbook. In the beginning here it says, Pasteur showed, Louis Pasteur, all living things come from other living things. This change re uh, in thinking represented a major shift in the way scientists viewed living things. Pasteur, uh, Pasteur's work convinced other scientists the hypothesis of spontaneous generation was not correct. Living things always come from what? Living things. That's the, bio, uh, the law of biogenesis, not abiogenesis, which is spontaneous generation, that living things can come from non-life, uh, which is an integral part of evolution. People say to me, no, 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 Dr. Jackson, P evolution theory picks up after life somehow got started all by itself. That's not a part of it. Then why does every single chapter on evolution begin with how life arose from non-living things? You see, I, I have no patience with that because you're lying when you say that. Evolution does start with no life on our planet, and then 
it generates life by chemical evolution. If I believed in evolution, I'd at least fess up to that my theory includes the origin of life. I mean, it does. It's in the books. It's everywhere. But uh, here we go. Also, uh, Rudolf Virchow and Schleiden and Schwann jointly uh, got the credit for the cell theory, which used to be called the cell law when I was in college. Uh, the cell theory says all living things are composed of cells. Cells are a basic unit, and new cells are produced from existing cells. New cells can be produced only from division of existing cells. So life comes from life, and cells come from cells. This is, these are principles in an early part of the textbook, Principles of Science, established long ago. Uh, Louis Pasteur himself, who invented vaccination and, uh, and was the great proponent of the germ theory of disease and, of course, pasteurization, and we know all about that. And he was the one who finally gave the death blow to spontaneous generation in 1864 in his, uh, his experiment, which he, per, uh, uh, which he presented to the French Academy of Sciences in 1864. Do not put forward anything you can't prove by experimentation. That's science. You know, there's, not, there's more in the life and the world and thinking than hard science. I understand that. But you can't take something that isn't hard science, smack a hard science label on it, and sell it and tell people you're anti-science if you don't buy this. Because you're not. As a matter of fact, you're in far more danger of being, really being anti-science, regardless of whether the majority votes you are or not, if you say something that soft science is really hard science. Experimentation. So on the same textbook, on page 425, it says, the puzzle of life's origins. A stew of organic molecules is a long way from a living cell, and the leap from non-life to life. Okay, there you go. On page 425, it now tells you life came from non-life. I'm sorry, that really contradicted the, the founding fathers of biological science from the 1800s. Geological evidence suggests about 200 to 300 million years after the Earth cooled enough to carry liquid water cells similar to modern bacteria were common. How might these cells have originated? So now they give you the plan on how life comes from non-life, a stew of inorganic, non organic uh, molecules that be become simple organic molecules all by themselves, then RNA nucleotides are formed, they assemble themselves into RNA, and at least they put question marks on this part here, uh, then they make proteins, they, they turn into RNA, and they originate DNA. Uh, in the, since RNA is a simpler molecule, most evolutionists believe RNA came first, uh, but then how did RNA get there? Uh, we have the RNA world hypothesis, is what that, that's called. Now, I'm not here to like insult anybody or anyone's intelligence. Uh, I'm just here to establish what things in the book are soft and aren't really science and what things in the book are experimentable upon, falsifiable, uh, verifiable, measurable, observable. Those are the things that are science. You can believe in evolution if you want, not, not because of this and not because of some of the other things I listed, and that's fine but you can't package it up and put a label of hard science on it. It just, it doesn't fit the qualifications, the principles, the definitions. What I'm trying to lay down here, what are the definitions? What is the qualification to be called a scientific model? Evolution doesn't have any of them, except majority vote. And consensus has never been very good at determining truth. That flat earth thing, the sun goes around the earth thing, Alfred Wegener stood alone in 1912 with continental drift. After he was dead, they finally decided he was right. All these kinds of things, um, truth is all that really matters. Evidence, we gather evidence, and then we make a decision, and maybe we do all kind of vote. But we try to vote tentatively. There's like 30 uh, theories on how the dinosaurs became extinct. But about eight years ago, we, you know, the scientists all got together and voted it was the asteroid. That whole theory of the iridium dust layer found by Walter and Luis Alvarez in 1981. And, and that's now the favorite theory. Doesn't make it right. I like the theory. Walter and Luis Alvarez, nice father and son scientist team. That's kind of cool. You know, and I did a, I did a big paper uh, in biogeochemical cycling for my doctoral degree on the iridium layer because I thought that was cool. But I mean, that doesn't mean they know for sure, for sure, that that's how the dinosaurs went extinct was a, a meteor, the impact theory. But we voted it was, and now no one's allowed to talk about it. <laughs> oh 
like the dinosaurs care, you know, what we decided. You know, like Pluto cares. Uh, you know, the universe really doesn't care. We sit on a park bench and we argue with someone, and it's almost like we truly believe the nature of the universe shifts back and forth with the tide of who sounds smarter in the argument. It doesn't matter how smart you sound. I'm sorry, maybe your ego and things like that you know, totally depend on sounding smart and winning an argument, but guess what? The universe just doesn't care a plug nickel about whether you sound smart while you're arguing about the universe. I mean, you could, you could hear and all you could vote that I'm really a girl. I mean, I could prove it, but I'm not gonna, okay? We're not going there. But, but I mean, you could argue, and you could, you, you could refuse any, any belief, any evidence I give you, and you can maintain that. But you know what? The nature of me just does not change because someone's arguing back and forth, and neither does the nature of the universe. And it takes courage to face it in your religion, no matter what it is, and in your science, no matter what stands you take. It takes courage to actually look at everything, face it, and deal with it. Because if you don't want the truth, I don't care who you are or what you believe, you are a hypocrite. Yeah, there's a little of the H in all of us, isn't there? That's true, we're not all consistent, but at least we ought to, you know, let God, the world, the universe, and science, and all truth soak into us and let it change us. Don't think you can change it. I mean, that's the definition of insanity, that you are out of touch with reality. I, I don't want that. I want the truth. I want to know what's real. Yeah, I do. Big sound of words, Dr. Jackson. Yeah, well, let's go on. This is Eugenie Scott, the head of the largest, the world's largest We Don't Like Creationist Club, the National Center for Science Education Incorporated. Uh, she's actually very intelligent. I've met her, heard her speak. She really is uh, pretty adamant in her war against people like me, but I do respect her because she doesn't say mean things like Richard Dawkins does about me, you know. But here she says here, facts are a dime a dozen. There's facts all over the place. Theories are the most important thing in science. Theories are important, but if they're not fact-driven, I don't think they're worth a dime. They must be fact-driven. The theories now being elevated above theories, your ideas, but theories are tested. Well, if they're tested, they're pretty important, but we've had theories that were wrong before. We had some other third cause that was doing stuff, and it wasn't the cause and effect relationship we thought. Uh, some of you like the, you know, Cumberbatch as, as Sherlock, but Arthur Conan Doyle was actually a genius, a scientific genius and a literary genius, and he had his character of Sherlock Holmes say, it is a capital error to theorize before one has the facts. Inevitably, one bends the facts to fit the theory rather than the theory to fit the facts. You've got to let the facts carry you. Now, interpretation of the facts is left up to us, but if there are facts that actually, no matter how you you know, square peg round hole it, it's never gonna go with your theory. You really need to dump the theory and get more facts. Uh, this was one of the things said in 2005, just when we were discovering, uh, getting glimmers, there was no such thing as junk DNA. Philip Kitchener from Columbia said, a lot of the DNA in there is not needed, it's junk. 98% of the DNA wasn't, wasn't supposed to be useful for anything. If it's intelligently, how many you ever heard of intelligent design? intelligent design theory. So he was kind of uh, knocking the intelligent design theorists. And he said, if it's intelligently designed, then God needs to go back to school. Ooh, watch for the lightning bolt there, you know. God needs to go back to school. But these, these kind of uh, blunt statements. Stephen Jay Gould, uh, one of the 20th century's greatest spokesmen for evolution, I heard him speak. Very smart man, uh, really, really adamant against creation, but a great teacher, very good speaker, and honest. I missed him when he died, and I wrote a blog saying that I missed his, his brutal honesty. He was like, guys, we got some holes in our theories. The creationists are getting after us on it. We got to get to work. And he put his money where his mouth is. He's the one with Niles Eldridge who came up with punctuated equilibrium in the 1970s and saved Darwin's rear end and that whole theory. Buoyed it on up uh, and, and did a great service and put his money where his mouth is. He was honest and looking for the truth. He was an atheist, so to him, the idea that a creator could have done any creating 
was uh, abhorrent and, and out of the question. He did not consider it. But given that, I thought, he, other than that, he was as open as he possibly could be. And I, I do miss him. No myth deserves a more emphatic death than the idea that science is an inherently impartial and objective enterprise. Because it's not. Scientists are people just like you and me. They're not 100% objective. Anyone who says, I'm objective, is either lying to themselves or you or both. No one's. 100% objective. I interpret all scientific evidence I see through the paradigm of the creation model, just like an evolutionist would interpret all new data through the evolution paradigm. Now, if you have troubles making that work for you, as Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? Uh, you um, in that case, you might have some problems. Uh, yet this idea that science is impartial continues to thrive among working scientists because it serves us so well. He was aware that people had made scientists the high priests of, of science if it was a religion. And he says, you know what, we're just like everybody else. Get over it. We're doing the best we can. And I did like his sincerity. Dr. Milford Walpuff, um, in the book Anth Paleoanthropology, 1999, from University of Michigan, says this. I believe a philosophical framework is not something that can be eliminated in order to provide objectivity. In my view, objectivity does not exist in science. Even the act of gathering data, decisions about what data to record and what to ignore reflect the philosophical framework of the scientist. Everybody's got a bias. The struggle is to keep your bias from filtering out things you would miss otherwise. If you keep your mind open, genius is the prepared mind for a lucky accident. I didn't write that or say that. I think it was uh, Hubert Alyea, but uh, I liked it. Uh, Darwin himself said um, in a letter to his Harvard professor friend, Asa Gray, I am quite conscious that my speculations run quite beyond the bounds of true science. He knew you couldn't experiment with this. He did believe his theory, of course, but he realized he wasn't going to be able to sell it with data and facts. Uh, and actually, Darwin was actually pretty much a shy guy, didn't like public attention very much. It was uh, Wallace and some of the other people at the time that really pushed his theory. Within three years, it was being taught at Cambridge after his book, The Origin of the Species, was published in 1859. This is a quote from uh, 2005 in the GeoTimes Journal, an article called Geology Versus Physics. I imagine Tchaikovsky is a, a geologist uh, or a physicist, uh, sorry. Evolutionists have physics envy. They tell the public that the science behind evolution is the same science that sent people to the moon and cures diseases. It's not. Science behind evolution is not empirical, but forensic. Uh, forensic science. What's that CSI stand for? Crime? Investigation? Yeah. Forensic science is looking at what stuff is now and trying to backtrack to what it was. What really happened? If forensic science, actually, you can't do any testing, no observations, no repeatability, no falsification, just inferences. And in a crime scene, that's all you've really got. Unless you've got a witness, and then you've got to believe the witness. Okay. Inferences is all you've got. I think this is what the public discerns, that evolution is just a bunch of just-so stories disguised as legitimate science. The Gallup polls keep showing less and less Americans actually buy into Darwinian evolution. And that would be frustrating if you're teaching it in your class. I think it'd be less frustrating if you taught evolution as a hypothetical construct, at least for heuristic value, but certainly not insisting that anyone who disagrees with it is actually anti-science. I'm not anti-science. I actually had a professor in Vermont shake her finger in my face and say, you are part of an anti-intellectual movement in this country. I'm not an anti-intellectual. Just because I disagreed with her, I'm an anti-intellectual. Well, I actually like intellect stuff. Uh, I heard Richard Dawkins speak at University of Oklahoma in 2009, and during the question and answer period, he made this statement. All biologists are evolutionary biologists. No, they're not. I'm a biologist, and I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Now, this is what bugs me about this statement. He knows that's a lie. He knows it's not true. He knows there are plenty. The guy who invented the MRI machine, Raymond Damadian, 
creationist like me. The guy who invented the gene gun therapy technique for the genetic engineering of plants, John Sanford at Cornell, he's also a creationist. He knows this isn't true. This is just propaganda. Now that's, that's, that's ingenuous, I'm sorry. I'm not very happy with, with uh, Richard Dawkins on that. Many, many of the men and women I meet in the evolutionist community have a lot more integrity and they're smarter than Dawkins. So there, I said it. He's not the sharpest tack in the box. And, and I saw the videotape from the uh, Beyond Belief conference in Austin, Texas a few years ago where Neil deGrasse Tyson chewed out Richard Dawkins for making them all look mean-spirited. And that's why they made him go on a lecture tour with, with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is actually a very personable and, uh, is, uh, person, got a good personality and is not offensive to people. Uh, he is a, a very uh, uh, adamant uh, crusader for atheism and for evolutionism. And, uh, but I, I have respect for him because he's, he's smart and uses good judgment, and he's a very gifted teacher. If you've seen the Nova Science things, uh, 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 Science Now, and now he's hosting the Cosmos series formerly done by Carl Sagan with billions and billions of, you saw that back in the 80s. So uh, that's also uh, an attitude, not science. But this was said at a, to a large audience. Uh, this is 1993, Discover Magazine. Everybody knows that organisms get better as they evolve. They get more advanced, more modern, and less primitive. And everybody knows, according to Dan McShay, who has written a paper called Complexity and Evolution, what everybody knows. Everybody knows that organisms get more complex as they evolve. The only trouble with what everybody, everyone knows, says McShay, an evolutionary biologist at University of Michigan, is there's no evidence it's true. Now, you can believe it, you can say that it could have happened. You know, true, it could have. But if you're going around saying, we have, we have uh, everything we need to be able to say it did happen, that's just not so. And that's what burns me up as a science teacher. I struggle to teach what's true. And if students ask my opinion on something, I'll tell them it's my opinion. Well, I, can, I suspect this, or I suspect that, um, but, uh, but if it's actually something factual that we've got hard science for, I do not hesitate to say, no, 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 uh, we know that uh, this is, you know, that you, you can only get STDs from, you can't get it from casual sexual context. Students ask me things like that. Uh, you know, that wasn't funny in the crowd, was it? <laughs> Ooh, we'll have to set up some kind of little medical counseling tent outside later. Okay. I've actually had people say this to me. Here it is. Uh, Natural History Magazine, 1993. As for the claim that evolution is an unproved theory, that's nonsense. Evolution is a fact established with the same degree of confidence as our theory of disease and the atomic theory of matter. Yes, there's lively debate about the particular evolutionary mechanisms that cause particular changes, but the existence of evolutionary change is not in doubt. Our own bodies provide walking evidence. If Lucky the Leprechaun made us, our bodies would be here as evidence. You see, there's a hundred different ways, other ways, that our bodies could be here. I was talking with Mitch Cruzan, the uh, vice president of the Darwin Coalition at the Darwin Festival at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, back in the 90s. And me and Dr. Cruzan were on a pretty good speaking, you know, we had, we had a pretty good relationship going, and, uh, and, and we were, you know, opposite sides of the battle, and we were talking, and he said to me, I just don't see how you can believe what you believe. And I thought he was really asking, so I started to explain. <laughs> no, it was rhetorical. And so, and then I said, well, I don't see how you can believe what you believe either, Mitch. And he went, well, he said, you and I are standing here having this conversation. How could that happen if evolution wasn't true? Okay. I'm not making fun of him. I'm saying that he really, it, this is so inculcated, so, so locked into the hardwiring of the thinking when you hear it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, that the evidence is overwhelming, the evidence is overwhelming, it's proven, it's a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact. You say that to each other enough, and you don't need evidence anymore. And that's, that's the sad, pitiful thing. So Dr. Cruzan was really only showing his blind spot there, and I understand that. But to say that just because we're here, evolution must be true, 
you know, wood elves could have made us. Martians could have seeded our DNA in our ocean, like in the movie Mission to Mars, and, and we would be here. So uh, you really, there are a lot of other ways. Everybody else's theory on how life began and humans got here would also have that. The only way you could say that the fact that we're all sitting here breathing and pumping our hearts and you're listening to me uh, is because evolution is true, is if you, I'm sorry I have to say this, but if you are just so locked up and narrow-minded that the only conception you can have is that your theory is the only one that could ever be right. That's not science. That's not even being nice. It's not politically correct, and it's not open-minded. It is not the spirit of inquiry that anything in life should have. Look, I don't go around saying, just because I'm a creationist, and I believe in God and all that, and I go to church and all that, that uh, you know, everybody else is an idiot, or I just discount anything else as being true. Yes, I can't prove creation is true. I'm satisfied with that model, though, as a scientific model, and yes, as a theological model, because it involves, you know, like, because creation has to have a creator, well, it's naturally, inherently a religious idea, but so is atheism. It's still a religious idea. Don't religious ideas tell us how we ought to live our life? And how you what you believe about how we got here actually is a guideline to you on how you would want to choose wisely to live your life. Michael Roos, an evolutionary philosopher who used to be at the University of Gulf in Ontario, Canada, and now he's got an endowed chairmanship at Florida State, can say anything he wants get an endowed chairmanship, that's, that's tenure to the max. He said, religion, he said that evolution, he can see why evangelicals are upset about evolution. He's a total evolutionist, okay? But he said, because it really takes the place of religion. It, it, it says, where, where'd we come from? How'd we get here? Where are we going? What's the meaning of life? Questions that are usually left up to religion. So he says, I can see why evangelicals are upset about evolution, because it is a full-fledged replacement for Christian thinking. It's a, it's a different paradigm for looking at the world. It's a different worldview. And you heard that word uh, used in my introduction. It's a different worldview. You know what? It's like Neo and the Matrix. The problem is choice. It's red pill, blue pill time. That's all it is. And there's really very little help to how to do this besides conscience, if you believe that sort of thing. Science? Mm-hmm. There's hard science. Um, the topic is, is Darwinian evolution scientific or not? Now, I hope you're seeing whether you want to believe evolution or not, or whether you, I do or not. Um, it's not a scientific proposition. Richard Feynman, um, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for helping to invent the atomic bomb, um, and was a very brilliant guy in science, said, um, Science is, well, I think he won the Nobel Prize made for something else, yeah, but he did help invent the atomic bomb. Science is a long history of learning how not to what? So we fooled ourselves in science lots of different times. And then we went, uh-oh, wake up call, my bad. We had to realize, oops, spontaneous generation's not true. Oops, the phlogiston theory isn't true. You know, oops, geocentrism isn't true. You know, and, and, and we correct it. And that's how science works. Yes, it's self-correcting. There are things that we accept as laws of science because everywhere in the universe and every observation we've ever made, they work, like the law of gravity. Now, this is Michael Roos, who I just mentioned. He said, and he also spoke at, uh, at OU uh, in 2009 and debated uh, uh, William um, um, Dembski, yes, of the, uh, the Intelligent Design Camp. He said, evolution is a religion. That was true of evolution in the beginning, and is still true of evolution today. Not because he's saying that they have a church and everything. He actually did a presentation I saw on how cathedrals and museums do look the same. Natural history museums and cathedrals are kind of laid out the same. And he did say, it's a way of looking at the meaning of life in the world and your place in it. If you are buying into wholesale evolution. Uh, and he's right, it's a worldview just like creation is a worldview. This is not science versus religion. It's not even science versus science. It's closer to religion versus religion, this whole question. Probably the most accurate way is to put it, worldview versus worldview. What is your Weltanschau, your worldview? Max Planck, how many have ever heard of the Planck constant? This is not from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Okay, this is a different Planck. 
personal friends with Albert Einstein, won the Nobel Prize himself in physics. He said this about science. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents all eventually die. And then a new generation grows up that's familiar with the ideas from the beginning. I mean, in his time, Alfred Wegener was mocked and ridiculed until the 1940s when he died. And then it was in the 1960s, ooh, you know, uh, continental drift is true. So that was our topic, is Darwinian evolution scientific or not? Now, this is the groundwork, this is the bulk, bulk, bulk work, this is the foundation that I wanted to lay with you of the case that it's not a scientific posit. Uh, the, oh, this is the contact information um, for me and uh, Creation Truth Foundation. I also have uh, my card from Hillsdale Free Will Baptist College here and also from Creation Truth Foundation here if you want to get cards from me a little bit uh, later at the end. I do teach physics and chemistry and biology over at Hillsdale. I have taught uh, in 15 different colleges. I taught at many different high schools, too, for 11 years. And I, I, I know I don't look that old, but I have been a professional teacher for 35 years now. Yay, you know. I, I did teach eighth grade science. The vortex of evil in the universe is eighth grade boys. Uh, my wife is a special ed teacher of eighth grade boys. And uh, as, uh, as I heard, the young lady here wants to go into special ed. Uh, they're delightful children. You know. <laughs> They're just more difficult. I have great respect for people who teach kindergartners and special ed people, because I don't have those skills. But then again, I'm here speaking to a university crowd. So I have tried to keep my, my thoughts and ideas palatable, uh, understandable, but also I wanted to make them high and critical enough uh, that, that it was uh, you know, intellectual fodder for a university crowd. I, have, I do speak to younger groups. I speak to sometimes uh, groups of solid professors. and. Uh, Oh yes, and what you're seeing here are some of the things that I showed you that are often touted as the, the lock solid proof that evolution's true. Uh, these things are soft science. Normally there's some other thing going on and not any kind of process that could actually get bacteria to turn into fish and then people, uh, which you can believe if you want, but don't, don't say it's because you say science is on your side or you're a slave to the data. Uh, and, and these other quotes. So I'll have those going by to kind of keep you in mind what you might want to ask, but yeah. Um, as, as, as Josh said, uh, as long as it's related to the topic, whatever questions you have are allowable. And uh, I've got a lot of uh, images and uh, charts and graphs and photographs from uh, scans from textbooks and things that I can refer to. Believe me, any of these things that I've shown you that textbooks say are like these, are evidence to total that evolution's true, yes, I do have a slam dunk for every one of those. Um, that's pretty good that there is a slam dunk. I didn't create these things, science did. The slam dunk on them as to why that isn't hard science. Uh, so you, you might not even want to ask any of those. I'd be encouraged if somebody did. Uh, but, uh, but if you don't, we'll go to something else that you think is relevant to the topic. Is Darwinian evolution a scientific or not? And that's what we're talking about here today. And remember, don't ask me a bunch of God questions because we need a preacher or some kind of theology professor for that. I'll do my best if you ask. I'll try. But I, I am not professionally trained in theology. And often theological questions come up during these things. But I am professionally trained in teaching and in science. 